Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and my fellow panellists who are all sitting on the front row at the moment. Well, it's been a long time, and just how great it is to be back in person at intermodal Europe and in this historic city of Amsterdam with its long and traditional maritime traditions. Thanks, Rob, Emma, Bonnie, and the whole team at Informa for giving me the opportunity to moderate this opening session, the Global Market Outlook. My name is John Fossey, and I'm consulting editor of World Cargo News. And I think before handing over to our panel of experts, I think we need to put a few issues into perspective. Without any shadow of doubt, it has been an incredible three years since we last met. And I'm sure you will agree it has been three years of wild fluctuations. At the start of the pandemic, we saw supply chains shut down, cargo volumes drop like a stone, containers refusing to take delivery of the containers, and ships actually being laid up. But by the summer of 2020, people who could not travel, dine out, or go to the cinema or theatre started spending their money and significant sums of money on making their homes and gardens more comfortable. That boom in the movement of consumer goods lasted from July of 2020 to the middle part of this year. And its impact on the industry was enormous. There was huge levels of congestion, partly fueled by labour shortages in ports and in inland distribution centres. Spot rates on the major trades were up eightfold and in some cases tenfold on pre-pandemic levels. Charter rates also rose significantly as every ship available was snapped up and put into service. There was a mass rush of ordering of new ships. In 2021, for example, more than 560 ships aggregating about 3.5 million TEU were newly contract, contracted sorry, at yards, primarily in Korea and China. There was record deliveries of new containers. In 2021, Chinese factories pumped out more than 6.6 .6 million TEU of dry freight boxes and mainly 40-foot high cube containers to deal with that boom in consumer durable transport. But now to our current situation, where the market is dipping, and I would say falling very, very fast. Rampant inflation is affecting consumption and investment. Trade levels are falling. And this is having a knock-on effect on the supply of equipment. As ships and containers are moving through the system more freely, so there's additional and oversupply in the market. Spot rates are declining, but contracts, contract rates are still high and much higher than last year, and carriers will continue to make solid profits this year. In terms of containers, there's probably a surplus of anywhere between five and six million TEU, and lessors and ocean carriers are now selling those containers, those aging containers, into the second-hand market. But outside of those trading challenges, we have further challenges that the industry needs to deal with. There's decarbonisation. New IMO regulations that kick in in January 2023 will have some impact on the availability of tonnage. There's the challenges of digitalisation and how ocean carriers and others in the industries adopt and deal with that situation. There's possibly changes to the block exemption regulation when it comes to consortia. And then there's that additional capacity that was ordered in 2021 and 22 to absorb into the market. So what sort of downturn are we heading for? How far will ocean carriers' profit levels fall? Are we back to the boom and bust days of liner shipping? Could we see a major restructuring of the global alliances and perhaps the emergence of one or two mega carriers? That is what I'm hoping our panel will give us some answers and some direction on this morning. But I'm also sure that you here, delegates, will have questions of your own. I would encourage you to listen to the presentations and to jot down any questions you might have. And then at the end of the session, we'll have a period of Q&A and debate. So that's over to you to come up with some interesting, some interesting questions. But moving on, let me introduce our first speaker. First speaker is Peter Creedon. He's over 30 years experience in the supply chain industry. 
including over 20 years as managing director, or, or as, uh, over 20 years working for Hamburg Sud, several of these years as managing director of Oceania for Hamburg Sud. Peter is based in Australia and is currently managing director of MPC International, an organization offering advice and innovative solutions for the supply chain industry. He's also a senior lecturer at the Australian Maritime College. Peter, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be at this event again. And it's great to see familiar faces. And, um, and I'm looking forward to chatting with people over the next few days. Our industry is going through the biggest change since the start of containerization. Digitalization and decarbonization are going to fundamentally change the way we work and the way we communicate with each other and as we establish a digital workflow. The changing landscape makes it really important for you to look at your workflow processes and understand how do you build your digital partnerships. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended the way we looked at the supply chain. It's moved from just in time to just in case, and now we're in the process of moving back to just in, uh, just in time. Well, we have about another two years before we actually sort out what is the new normal, whether it's freight rates, whether it's the capacity, but we have a, a couple of big challenges on our hand. From boardrooms, senior management, and now the general public are really interested in what we do, and there is a keen interest on supply chain visibility. The good news is since the start of the year, the supply chain uh, is starting to unwind the, the disruption and the bottlenecks. And we're moving towards back to a normal position. It still will take another year before we get the vessel schedules back into reasonable um, uh, alignment, and then we will overcome the equipment imbalances. The, the shipping lines will start off hiring a lot of containers and that over excess of boxes will be interesting to see how that impacts the secondhand market. The new interest in supply chain management and supply chain visibility has driven a big demand for startup companies and investments in startup companies. Back in 2017, less than 10 billion US dollars were invested into our industry, and, uh, but over the last three years, each year, over $24 billion has been invested in our industry. This has driven over, there's now over 700 different startup companies that are trying to solve every problem, real or imagined, in our supply chain. These startup companies now have to wake up and realize that we've hit the peak the valuations are coming back uh, to more reasonable levels uh, from 60 times a bit, uh, now they're down to 40 times a bit. Uh. And then these startup companies need to make money and actually prove there is a market for their solutions. The significant is investment is because the VC firms and the industry realize that we have an enormous opportunity. We need to modernize the way we do business, and we need to follow the other industries through the digitalization curve. We need to move up the digitalization curve so we can ensure that we can use those advanced technologies. More than half of our industry still manages their processes manually. So they're in stage one. They need to actually reconcile the silos in their organization, their silos and their databases, their legacy systems, and they need to build a single source of truth. That internal view has to be sorted before they can move into stage two. The other half of the industry has learned that digital standards and building that one-to-many connection is important. So they're working on improving the digital uh, workflow with their clients or with their vendors, and they're slowly moving up, uh, like up the digital curve. It's important to understand that this is critical. Before we can apply advanced technologies across the industry, we have to understand that our employees need to manage the process and not simply do the process. We have to eliminate 
manual work. As a whole, our industry is about five years away before we are able to develop a good, mature digital ecosystem. This is why it's important for you uh, to drive your companies to be future fit. At MPC International, we work with boards and senior management teams to develop their own digital roadmaps or digital strategies to overcome and actually meet the challenges in the future. In a, a report in 2019, 60% of companies have never addressed innovation or digital transformation as a part of their board meetings. It's a serious issue. If the leadership team does not make it a priority, the rest of the organization will not take up the challenge of digitalization. And it's critical that we think about that because we have the next disruption coming, decarbonization. As Peter Drucker famously stated, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. This is why I firmly believe that digitalization is intimately entwined with decarbonization. We need to move forward. If we're going to manage our greenhouse gases targets, the IMO um, has clearly defined that we're going to reduce 70% of our greenhouse gas targets by 2050. As mentioned by John in, uh, in the introduction, IMO 2023 is our next challenge. It has already started. It actually, the soft start starts this month, but the hard start will be in June of 2024. This is effectively establishing a carbon rating system on every vessel. This will have a big impact. It'll effectively put a speed cap on our industry. It will force vessels to slow down and it will force vessels into a rating system to meet an A, B, or C classification system. Those vessels that do not meet that classification system will have to be phased out. So that is where we will see an absorption of some of the new builds that are coming out of the shipyards. The good news is the BCOs are interested. They have set their own ambitious sustainability targets. They are driving demand and they're putting pressure on our industry to reduce carbon faster and making more lively. We're seeing this by the shipping lines are now are making the investments into alternative fuels. About 50% of the vessels in the shipyards or on the order books are for these some type of uh, alternative fuel pr propulsion systems. So overall, in the next two years, we're in transition. Uh, the shipping lines are going to start their off hire campaigns and phase out project. The aging boxes should be phased out uh, of, of our industry. And this is good news for the secondhand market, which has been starved of secondhand containers over the last three years. Hapek Lloyd's decision earlier this year to upgrade all of their containers with IoT devices is a turning point for our industry. Hapek Lloyd has signaled that they're no longer just competing with other shipping lines, but they're competing with and possibly partnering with visibility platforms. Having this full visibility over their containers is extremely important. If the other shipping lines want to become 3PL players, they need to follow suit and upgrade their fleets. Strategically, the battle for the middle mile, the movement from the port to the DC or the DC back to the port is only going to increase as the supply chain tries to vertically integrate. The shipping lines will be using the purchase of new alternative fuel vessels as a barrier of entry to any newcomers. And there will be newcomers as long as the industry is profitable. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here at the conference, but I'm excited that we're finally at the stage that the industry is ready to move forward. I'm looking forward to seeing how we can push the industry up the digitalization curve and act so we can apply advanced technologies to like predictive analytics to improve the supply chain to unlock real benefits. I look forward to seeing how we can actually tackle the challenges of decarbonization as well. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing what my other panelists have to say.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, we'll take the Q&As right at the end of all of the presentations. Um, our next speaker is Godfrey uh, Smith. Um, Godfrey is the uh, Secretary General of the European Shippers Council, a position that he has occupied since 2020. He's an expert in indirect taxation and super, superational uh, law, but I'm sure he's going to talk to us about uh, some of the challenges that uh, shippers have experienced and are about to uh, confront in the future. Over to you, Godfrey. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, like the previous speaker, I'm also excited being here in such a big audience, even st people standing up at, uh, at the back. So, um, indeed, um, as the, in the introduction was mentioned, uh, we were, in fact, uh, more or less uh, said that we would have our crystal balls to see what the future will bring. And then if we look back, if we look back one year and we see where we are now, no one, I think, would have said that this situation as we are in now with the terrible war in the Ukraine would have emerged. So that makes it uh, clear how difficult it is to predict the future. Perhaps a few words of introduction on on shippers, of course, uh, may, many of you know the definition of a shipper, but there are different ones. In our organization, the European Shippers Council, we normally take the definition as senders, but also as receivers of cargo. So that's a broad definition, and this definition is applied as well here in Europe as for our global organization, the Global Shippers Alliance. What's our objective? And then you immediately see that this objective is still there um, to battle for. That the objective is in fact that goods arrive at the right time, in the right direction, in the right condition, and in the most sustainable way. And there is also the link to the previous speaker on sustainability, which is really important. And then, last but not least, there is of course the fair price. And many of you know we have a discussion in, uh, in Brussels now, for instance, on CBER, and we hope to have a, a system, a new system in place perhaps in the course of the next two years. So in the beginning of this year, we had a meeting between carriers, container carriers and shippers and we asked them what is really the most important issue for you. And the answer was, this is reliability. Reliability in the supply chain, even more than pricing. So it's important we move in that direction. But if we look at the situation as it's now, we see that uh, probably also due to COVID, um, which in fact uh, had the consequence that it was difficult to exchange crews. It was a highly increased demand. It was difficult to fulfill all these needs. But now, as was already said, and, or, or, and I think also by the speakers after me will be also said, that demand seems to drop. This is really a message I get from a lot of my members. But at the same time, we also get a signal that many ships will be taken out of the schedule because of they need maintenance um, or they are simply brought into the market to go into the market for this high demand. Also from, from shipper side, um, I won't, don't want to blame other partner, partners in the supply chain to not delivering what we would like to have, but it's also our own behavior. It's important that shippers find ways to make the supply chain more reliable, and for instance, also delivering a more reliable forecast to other partners in the supply chain. If we look at a very long uh, period of time, it's of course very difficult. If you are a carrier and you have to invest in extra capacity in the market, yeah, what should you do at the moment? And most 
uh, of the ships are already ordered, are on the, on the um, design tables, or are already delivered to the market. For that reason, it's often very, very difficult to, to do it. But it's also important to look at a bit shorter term. And there, I think, the key message I would like to give to you is the collaboration in the supply chain. This is still not at an optimum. We still see a lot of, see a lot of paper in the supply chain, which makes it impossible to have an optimal collaboration there. And also the use of containers, for instance. Uh, um, on the previous speaker, we saw uh, already some messages there. But you see that containers with our members are often um, taken into their premises much too long. They are used as a kind of uh, stocking warehousing issues and not as a transport uh, issue. So it's important also to raise awareness there to my members and to do that together in the supply chain. Also, we hear and we listen to the supply chain partners about more reliable forecasting. It's, it's, it's also important from the side of carriers that we get signals on the available capacity Sometimes I also make there the comparison with the booking system of airlines with passengers. They book passengers uh, normally up to 110% because they uh, have always passengers not showing up. But if you look in the maritime industry, in fact, the carriers stay on booking, which often brings us then in the situation that containers stay on the quay. So I think there that um, also digitization would make it possible for us to exchange this information and to make the um, booking process more, um, more efficient. Also, information is a very important thing, which seems to be an open door, but still having information about blank sailings, but also about delays, is important for a shipper because if they get this timely, they can make their precautions and they can also inform their customers. We know that a lot of efforts already have been done by carriers in giving this information and making it available. But at the same time, this is not always known by shippers and perhaps you see that the information sometimes lands with logistic service providers. Also, what we, we like to do is um, in our annual meeting with our uh, Global Shippers Alliance, we have launched a kind of um, paper called the, um, the, 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 the Cargo uh, Rights. And in fact, we make there also a comparison what we see in the for the passenger transport in the rail and at airports. We think that especially the smaller shipper is not in a balanced position regarding his contractual relation with carriers. And we have made a kind of, you could say, a kind of outline to make a contract more balanced and also especially for those working on the spot market to give them a better position. Then I think that in our environment, a lot of people do really great work, like the Digital Container Shipping uh, Association. They are making good standards, and these standards will help also to make the, uh, uh, the, the supply chain more uh, sustainable, but also more efficient. So then the last message, because uh, all, uh, the, uh, otherwise we would uh, go um, over time, I think it's important to look at the capacity in ports. Now with the mega vessels, what we see is that the possibility to um, go there is uh, limited. If you have a full loaded, uh, very modern and uh, largest container vessel, the southern European ports are in fact not possible to use. And there is a lot of idle capacity there. 
in having a more diversification in the supply chain and also in the ship types, it would um, make available this capacity and it would take away some of the problems we now are facing in the supply chains. Ladies and, gen ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and I hope that I raised uh, already some questions with you which we will deal at the end of this session. And then I return the floor to our moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Godfrey. And uh, you've set out um, the stall there for, for the shippers' uh, uh, requirements and how overall the industry uh, can be improved in, in terms of that side of uh, the equation. Now, I'm not too sure whether Michelle is here. Oh, Michelle is here. Okay. So, um, welcome our next speaker, Michelle uh, Steckelnberg. He's Senior Director of Strategic Accounts um, at Project 44, which is an advanced visi visibility platform, sorry, for shippers and third party logistics uh, operators. Um, Michelle, welcome to the podium. Um, yeah, good afternoon, of course, good morning, sorry. Um, welcome to see you um, all. Um, I today want to focus really on data, uh, real-time or near real-time visibility data. So thanks for the previous speakers. Um, I saw so many touching points already, like collaboration, uh, uh, decarbonization, sustainability. Um, I'm, I'm very passionate about data and, and, and technology and how uh, technology in combination with data can, can support companies in um, accelerating the, 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 the transition, the digital transition, basically. Um, so I really see data as being, you know, the, 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 the blood in a human body. You need to have the right level of knowledge, and knowledge nowadays is data. Um, and that is key for running a successful business, that is key for um, accelerating a digital transformation, which we all are in, uh, and which is a high need. And I'll touch base on, on some of the data aspects, but sustainability, of course, besides visibility, uh, be so, because I think sustainability is also part of transparency. You need to have uh, visibility on your in-transit transports, but also on carbon emission, right? And, and I heard the wording like, you cannot change what you cannot measure. It is so true. It is ab absolutely uh, spot on. I'm just trying to figure out how to move to the next slide. Yeah, so we already co covered that. Um, um, again, very passionate to be here today, but also passionate about technology. That's also why my second role is there. Uh, I'm also a board member of the CSCMP Benelux which gives me uh, the ultimate platform to share my passion with uh, uh, people like you, industry professionals. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the current uh, state of the, the market? What, what are we looking at today? Um, and please move on to the next slide. But what I see in my daily uh, uh, business is that it is start, still so inefficient, right? So there are so many disruptions nowadays caused by lack of uh, um, um, technology, lack of availability of data. Um, and it, it, it basically touches base across the whole organization from procurement, from manufacturing, warehousing until final delivery. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it, it's all about having this, this poor visibility, which comes with a lot of manual operations, uh, inefficient processes, uh, unhappy or at least uh, not a very high level of customer um, uh, uh, experience. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but it's, you know, visibility and, and having automated visibility in, in place. It's all about moving away from inefficiencies as much as you can. Moving away of all those manual activities. We call that like Wismo calls, where's my order? Uh, why are companies still doing that, whereas they can focus on building and developing strong relations with their partners, how to improve business, how to become more sustainable, how to create a more resilient supply chain, get rid of these manual, manual interactions and automate that process by having that, that visibility, that creating that transparency across your supply chain. And uh, I also heard about collaboration. Um, 
visibility is not just you know, investing in, in a tool, making sure you as a company are able to have visibility on your own processes. Maybe even more important is how do you use that to better serve your clients? How can you share that visibility with, with your stakeholders internally, but also externally? Your suppliers, your customers, they also need to have access to that same visibility. Um, so it's, it's all about sharing that transparency, not within your own chain, to optimize your own processes, which is the starting point, but then also being able to share that with other stakeholders, your customers, your suppliers, to create this, this fully transparent ecosystem, 360 degrees trans transparency. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so trends and, and market expectations, uh, I already mentioned it is all about today quite conservative, and that's also the industry. Uh, I'm glad that we see a, 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 a transformation which is ongoing. Um, and which all comes by moving away from being very static, becoming way more dynamic, um, becoming way more proactive as a business, right? Uh, you need to have smart technology in place. You need to have data combined with machine learning, AI, which allows you to get predictiveness or maybe prescriptiveness. And having tools in place, which allows you to, um, to manage your business, to drive your business based on exception management. Right? But you need to have that visibility in place. Um, also, um, the visibility itself, the industry itself, is also evolving. It, it all started by track and trace. I started to kind of dislike the term because nowadays we are like miles, to, miles ahead. Uh, it, track and trace is just a part of it. But again, it's all about exception management. It's all about predictiveness. It's all about... Um, where is my order? So in the early days, it was about tracking a vessel or tracking a truck. Uh, today's world is all about being able to understand at order level, what is the state of my shipment? When can I expect my goods to arrive um, at, at the warehouse or at the final delivery address? Uh, but also inventory. Uh, companies are still holding a lot of stock just because they don't know. So. Um, also having visibility at SKU level, at stock level, very important. Next slide, please. Yeah, carry on. So um, in terms of, and, and please, please um, go on. So in terms of what the value is for visibility, I think for most of you it's very obvious. Uh, first of all, it's all about creating this more resilient, uh, sustainable supply chain but it, it has so many aspects of value and it touches so many uh, aspects within your organization. Um, customer experience, right? Uh, uh, operational efficiency. Uh, how can I use visibility to reduce transpo transportation costs? Reducing dwell times, reducing costs for detention and emerge. We need to know where containers are stuck in specific ports, for example. Um, allowing you to become more, way, more, more efficient and to reduce those tra transportation costs. Uh, stock, work in capital, right? Um, that can be reduced if you know exactly where stock sits, uh, when st uh, stock in transit will arrive at, at the warehouses. It will allow you to look into your safety stock levels and, and figure out, can I start reducing that? Um, but also sustainability, and um, again, uh, you cannot change what you cannot measure. Uh, I think one of the most toughest uh, uh, pieces of uh, sustainability to measure is scope three emissions, right? Uh, scope one and two is a bit more easy. You have that under control yourself. Um, but this is something we also do at Predict 44 is, is going beyond just tracking and tracing, going beyond just visibility. Uh, but also providing that carbon emission scope tree visibility on ocean and, and roads. Uh, and these are early days. I'm not going to say that we can do all, uh, but we're getting there. Ocean is quite mature. Road is getting there as well. And our goal is that by the end of, of 2023, um, we adhere and we are able to provide that at very granular level, uh, fully compliant with the GLEC uh, certification, so IMO, ISO, uh, um, so you can, um, as an organization, are able to uh, report um, in adherence to these, to, to these new standards. Very important. All right, next slide. So 
I'll keep it short because I'm just looking at the clock. Um, what is a, a, a journey if you implement visibility? Next slide, please. It is, it is a journey, right? You first need to have the network, uh, then you need to have a, a, a strong data foundation. The data needs to be clean, so it can be normalized. Um, and then you start um, experiencing the benefits of predictiveness. Um, later on, it's a maturity, it's a journey. Um, prescriptiveness, right? So now, tomorrow, and then future is really also automation, prescriptiveness, meaning that we tell you what the alternatives are if you have delays, for example, in the predictive ETA. Can I do rerouting, replanning? Are, in today's world, we tell you there's a problem, but you need to act. The future will be that we start telling you what to do, right? And it's all a maturity uh, journey. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of value buckets, short term, easy. Operational efficiency, that is almost a snap of the finger. Uh, same with cost uh, reduction. Of course, that grows in due a time, but uh, reducing cost due way to efficiency gains is just uh, a very fast short-term uh, value bucket. Mid-term is all about um, improvement on working capital. Um, already mentioned that reducing your inventory stock levels, things like that. And, and long-term is all about how can I start driving new business models? And we see a lot of companies who are using the data to create, for example, a more digital supply chain, but also a more digital sales organization, moving away from conservative ways of selling to doing that online, having their own e-commerce or uh, customer portals, and where they use visibility to attract those customers to register to these portals. All right, next slide, please. This was it. So thank you, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, it's, uh, it's again a pleasure. I'll be walking around here, so anyone who would like to catch up and, and, and learn more uh, would love to have a chat. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That's a very thought-provoking uh, presentation, actually, and I'm sure we've all got some uh, questions and some issues to debate with you at, at the end. Thank you, Michelle. So moving on to our next speaker, uh, Nigel Pusey. Uh, Nigel is uh, CEO of Container Trade Statistics, uh, based in the UK, and a non-executive director of the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. Uh, start, Nigel spent many years in the line of shipping industry, and I first met Nigel when he was at p and Ned Lloyd uh, many, many years ago, but he's also served spells at Maersk and Unifeeder as well. So, Nigel, over to you for your presentation. Thank you. John, uh, good morning, uh, fellow visitors to Intermodal. It's great to see so many people back at an industry show. Um, I've been, uh, dare I admit it to my team, 35 years in this industry, and I've been waiting for the transformation of data and technology, having chaired Intra, having led uh, electronic bills of lading companies. Um, I'm still hoping and praying that we will have an electronic bill of lading once in our time. But today, uh, um, I chip, but what I want to talk to you about, we've heard about data, I'm thinking, crikey, sitting there, uh, how do we talk about data now? Because we've heard it all. But I'm going to talk to you about a different type of data that's type changing the way this business is working. So if we, um, let me try and see if I can uh, get on to the next one. That's not, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Doing it at the same time. OK. Um, is data finally transforming this industry? Uh, Secondly, I want to talk a bit about how actually data is in the here and now changing the contractual relationship between shipping lines and customers in a way that some of us never believed would happen. Uh, and it's a fascinating question as to whether that will survive the downturn. And the second is creating the transparency at a strategic level of data to how is that actually going to change the way that external parties view this industry. Oh, sorry. No, it's not going forward. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I'm there now. Sorry, apologies. OK. Um, the transformation in the last two years has changed C-suite's attention away from issues that they thought were the real risks in their business to transportation. Never in the last 10 years has uh, C-suite had so much impact on how information affects their industry 
and how actually strategic transport and logistics is. The number of C-suite people I've spoken to in my short term as already as C CEO of CTS is amazing because suddenly their risk register is full of issues relating to transport and statistics. And to do that, they require data. And that data transformation is starting to be incredible. The issue is, will it survive? We've seen significant investments, the likes of Zanata, NYSEX, Project 44 this week. Uh, you know, a number of companies are getting massive injections of capital into the data in this industry. So perhaps this is the turning point that many of us have believed should happen. Established players are starting to create data hubs where you can access massive amounts of data on this industry to determine whether that be volume, just in time, uh, whether the vessel's arriving, uh, where the congestion is. This is making a massive difference to the transparency and availability of data in our industry. We're getting, and some may feel that, you know, with the shipping lines making plus 200 billion profit, consulting companies are starting to be passionately interested in container shipping in a way they've never been before uh, and are buying data to actually make their economic, global economic databases have shipping involved as well. We have increased government awareness. Uh, uh, Godfrey was mentioning CBER. We've also got um, the whole issue about how data is managed, all being examined at the present by the EU Commission. So suddenly we have all stakeholders looking at strategic data in a way we've never seen before in this industry. Will they continue to hold us to account? At a secondary level, we have probably the one biggest change that's taken place in the contracting between the shipping line and uh, their customers. We're having priced index contracts. They have effectively allowed the shipping line and the customer to come to an agreement where a contract is managed by a transparent process. The index there is reflecting whether whichever index you're looking at reflects what they believe the market is telling them and is independently correlated to the way the, the market is moving. Uh, AP Mon and Maersk have suggested that 70-75% of their contracts at this present time are on a long-term basis. That's a massive change. Uh, it reflects what some of us have believed, and certainly when I was in the shipping world, that you have to treat a ship like a warehouse. And if we could contract out the ship like the way we contract out a warehouse, that would make a massive difference to the stability, which is what everybody's looking for. Godfrey mentioned it earlier. We're not worried too much about the prices, the volatility, in a certain extent, that's actually causing the challenges. Customers, on the other hand, have suddenly found, as we were talking about, as I was talking about earlier in terms of risk management, they're having to look to how they can have the consistency of supply chain. And data, in terms of whatever type of data that customer requires, to strategic data is becoming just as important as the operational data that McGill was referring to earlier. There are many price indexes out there from spots to long terms, and I'm not talking about anything in particular one, but the key thing is these price indices are what reflects best that your particular market allows you to do. And it's fascinating how those indices have become, let's say, contentious in the way that they, how are they best reflecting the market? The question we have, and the most vital one really, is are those contracts going to continue to underpin the relationship? Because I fundamentally believe they are the way to control a, let's say, more uh, stable relationship between shippers and their lines. The challenge is if rates collapse, um, and in fact, as you can see from here, this is uh, the CTS index versus spot contract index, as you see at the moment, you can see the spot contract is, is falling off. But in reality, the long-term contracts, like CTS index uh, supplies, uh, is actually much slower. But that is as a direct impact of those long-term contracts still in place. And the key in the next six months is how that line matches the spot contract line. Uh, and it's going to be the fascinate, most fascinating thing in the next six months is how that relationship will continue. So finally, uh, the transparency in the industry. It seems to me that the industry has had a lot of time spent trying to hide its data. It's a crazy thing, and 
I shouldn't really say this, but in us, we have to protect our data for three months through a thing called a safety mechanism because they were scared that we would share it with each other. But yet there's thousands of people out there supplying data way ahead of the curve of anything the lines are allowed to show. And the authorities are now demanding data from us like we've never had it before. Because we were talking about CBER, we're talking about the uh, relationship on um, sharing of data contracts with the EU. That is gonna, they're coming under immense scrutiny and our belief that we are a different type of industry is, is disappearing rapidly. I believe that you know, this will help in the competition issues to understand what is, really, what is real competition in this industry. And I think we will suddenly find that the data actually unlocks some of those strategic questions that are out there and will be resolved by 2024. Price indexes, as I've mentioned, if they can be at the bedrock of a contract between shipper and the, uh, a shipper and the customer, I think they fundamentally represent an opportunity for this industry to find a mechanism with which to work with each other to have contractual relationships that work and are seen as symbiotic and not confrontational. Interestingly, the data providers are also looking for due diligence around the industry. It's not just about supplying a number. It's about saying, well, how does my contract compare with others? And that's a fantastic opportunity for the industry to open up and share data and say, actually, we're not frightened of sharing that data. This industry can match what anybody else does in this area. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much for listening and uh, look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Um, and moving on to our last presentation um, in this session, I'd like to welcome to the uh, podium uh, Stein Rubens. He's a senior advisor in Drury Supply Chain team. He's worked for Drury for more than eight years. And prior to that, he spent 15 years in various positions in the brake bulk chartering and inland operations sectors of the industry. Stein, welcome to the podium. Thank you, John, for that uh, introduction. And a nice good morning from me to all of you. Uh, it's great to see so many people. Um, on behalf of Drury, I'll be sharing with you what we think is the market outlook for liner shipping. Uh, and I'll be drawing most of the data from our container forecaster publication, which is a quarterly publication uh, that came out, the most recent one, uh, at the end of September. Now, as we will see, and as it also uh, is reflected by what some of my uh, co-speakers have been talking about, six weeks is a very long time in liner shipping these days. Um, voila. So this is the tagline of that uh, third quarter container forecast written by my colleague Simon Heaney. He says, the carrier industry is now entering a period of managed decline. And capacity management will be key to deciding how much of the super cycle gains the carriers hold on to. And that is precisely what we are seeing unfolding now um, at different uh, pace of speed uh, on different trade lanes. Just to illustrate what we refer to with the super cycle gain, this is our World Container Index, which comes out weekly and is uh, freely available on our website. All you need to do is uh, register every Thursday. Uh, we publish the World Container Index, which covers the main east-west trades, both head -hold and back -hold, also the transatlantic trade, and this is the composite, so it's the average of the global conditions. Uh, so you will not see the $25,000 mark on this chart, which, is, uh, which uh, you know, was a great rate on, on some trade rates, but it illustrates that price volatility is not a bug, it's a feature of the industry. But if you compare what we've gone through in the last 18 to 24 months, everything we've seen before simply evaporates by comparison. If we go to the supply, if we look at supply, so this is where the carriers have an impact. Um, what can we see? Fully cellular fleet passed the 25 million TU milestone this year. Um, 
importantly as well is our five-year compound average growth rate expectation is 3.4%. So this is not simply the order book, this is the Drury forecast taking into account slippage, layups, uh, contracts, annulations, the, you know, all the, the measures and uh, the final slide will go into more details there. Um, but remember the 3.4%, that's important uh, later on. Positive news when looking at the fleet, here we see the order book by fuel type. So the different fuel types, uh, clearly LNG is the big winner now on this roadmap to decarbonization. It is expected to give about uh, a 30% reduction uh, in CO2 emissions, so it is by no means the end point of this decarbonization journey, uh, but it's a start. LNG, 50% of the fleet, uh, methanol, 9% of the fleet. Just last week, there was another large order from uh, Costco, I believe. Um, so, yeah, we can update those slides uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, but, but it gives you the, 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 the picture, right? 40% of the fleet st is still currently aiming at traditional carbon fuels. That's what I have on supply. If we turn to demand, it's interesting to see that um, the projects for the, the prospects for demand, the demand outlook has been worsening uh, for at least five quarters now. And just last quarter, so between June and September, the outlook for next year's global demand basically halved. Um, it was 3% and it is now 1.7%. Um, for us, this is an input in our modeling. And we can only hope that the economists have grasp the full extent of the downturn because by no means is this the final verdict uh, on what will be uh, the position for next year. Um, next slide, this is our demand forecast. Um, and I would turn your attention to the last bullet there. So on the five-year compound basis, we expect 2.8% demand growth. So structurally, fundamentally, there is a return of overcapacity uh, to the market If we combine supply and demand here, so the dark line is uh, 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 you know, a measure for demand. It's the world container throughput across all ports. Um, and then we have the world fleet. And we can see that the position of undersupply, which occurred in uh, 2020, 2021, uh, is coming to an end this year. And so we're set for a good few years of uh, you know, business as usual, more or less. This then is the jury view on next year and, and what the carriers can do to mitigate this influx of capacity because on a, um, on a nominal basis, the surplus of capacity would be 34% next year, which is truly a, um, you know, a gloomy outlook for next year's. So, um, so the first line there is the new built NB stands for new built. So the new built deliveries, we are expecting a 34% over capacity. We expect the carriers um, to start scrapping ships again. Um, they, have, they haven't scrapped since uh, beginning of 2020, really. Um, so we expect that to pick up again to an almost record number of 600,000 TUs. Obviously, this also takes into account the, the new IMO legislation. So some of the older and some of the smaller vessels will become less economic to operate. So we deduct scrapping, we deduct port congestion. Port congestion, uh, we estimate, has taken up 17% of the vessel capacity last year. For this year, uh, our estimate is that it is still 7%. So only the resolution of port congestion is injecting 10% of capacity into the market again. So we think, uh, uh, sorry, I was mixing the years there. For next year, we think the impact will still be 7%, uh, but that is also uh, coming to an end. Because we, we track capacity, right? We have the satellite data uh, available these days. We can see the number of waiting times, the number of waiting events is going down globally. First in the smaller ports and the secondary ports, it's still very much there in the, in the larger ports. Also geographically, we're seeing a big shift um, anyway, but for the sake of time, I'll not go into the congestion uh, subject too much. 
um, idling. So we, yeah, idling of ships will come back, uh, enabling the carriers to reduce some of that overcapacity. Uh, slippage, which means some of the deliveries that were contracted for this year will slip into next year. Um, and slow steaming, we don't see will have a, a big impact. Uh, we've done the analysis. So, but that leaves us with a surplus capacity of about 11%. And the only way the carriers can adjust that is blank sailings. So when we talk about uh, reliability uh, and price, on the pricing side, things uh, are back, um, sorry, are moving back towards a, a more, uh, you know, sustainable position, if you like. But on the reliability front, we don't think uh, there's much improvement coming in the next 12 months. Voila, that was my last slide. Uh, and I'll hand over back to John.